Thank you. One of my favorite architects once said, uh, I prefer drawing to talking. It is faster and it leaves less room for lies. And I guess I can relate, but uh, it's nevertheless a pleasure to talk to you today, of course, of, on behalf of myself, but also my partner, Willem Christensen. Uh, our office is an architectural office, but we do designs in many scales. So we do products and interiors, buildings, of course, but also urban planning and uh, public spaces and it's urban planning in Norway uh, with an emphasis on public space that I want to talk about today. Um, as we've seen many times today, we're living in a world which is getting more and more urban, uh, and by 2050, 70% of us are going to live in cities. But if you look at the current density map of Europe, then Norway still has a lot of space. It's still fairly <laughs> sparse, uh, maybe with the exception of a few city centers. So you could say, Historically, while Europe was out conquering the world to get more land, we've always been in a situation where we had plenty of land. <laughs> and this is a bit of a caricature because, of course, we had cities and we had city centers. Uh, the need uh, to have social spaces where you could actually uh, trade and shop and needs that uh, later have been fulfilled through shopping malls or even the Internet. Uh, and a lot of these spaces uh, are now working extremely well whenever there's a need for a large gathering. Uh, but the real challenge is to make them work in an everyday scenario. So in the, in the context of these existing urban spaces, you can always talk about a repair situation where we have to redefine and uh, again take a look at uh, the spaces that are often overdimensioned and underprogrammed for today's situation. But of course, we're not only dealing with repairing existing urban spaces, we're also creating a lot of new ones. Um, uh, um, places that used to belong to the periphery are slowly growing together with our city, uh, and large parts of waterfronts are being liberated from the industry, and in these parts, of course, we need public spaces, but they are created more uh, with the thought on uh, leisure than need, maybe. Um, and in these parts, you could say there's a big focus on the buildings, and that's of course partially because they're extremely expensive. There's a high amount of cultural buildings being uh, moved to these areas, and the architecture is very lavish, so perhaps it's to compensate for a very high-end image that uh, an extremely high amount of public spaces and parks are being created in these areas. So how much exactly? If we take a look at this example, uh, it was um, um, uh, something that was launched very early in the Fjord city of Oslo process. And you can see in orange marked out is what, it, what is gonna be the public spaces. Uh, and in itself, it looks like a very good strategy, but what is interesting about this map is that there is no evaluation of the scale of the public spaces. And they're also, also seen uh, or taking out of their uh, connection to the surroundings. So if uh, there was an updated map of this public space uh, mapping, it would look something like this. So it's a bit hard to, to uh, figure out the use of all this public space when you don't uh, read the actual context. And it's also interesting in the previous map that the opera is not counted as public space, while well, in fact it is one of the most successful public spaces in Oslo today. So can we actually talk about a replacement for quality with quantity and in uh, an area that we just saw where 60% of the space is going to be open public spaces and parks? Do we really know what we're going to use it for? Uh, as an example, uh, some of these spaces are quite huge. And uh, here you see, of course, the opera. But next to the opera, you have the opera square. And next to the opera square is another square. So you have a square before a square before a square. And they're all quite equal size. But what is interesting is that uh, before you start to repair and uh, look at the existing situation, you just build a new one. So it's a proper paradox, I would say, that uh, on one hand we're completely res resisting density and urbanity, while on the other hand we're building uh, areas so dense that housing programs are left in the shade most of the time. 
and the openness of the city floor is left uh, quite closed um, because of the facade system that covers it. I want to briefly show three projects that we've uh, done uh, that have all dealt with the problematics and opportunities of repairing and creating public spaces. And the first one is a square just outside Oslo. It's um, a very central square that we're working on right now. And it's located in between the train station and the pedestrian street. So it has all the opportunities of being a very uh, vibrant and central square. Um, nevertheless, uh, the current situation shows a square which is quite malfunctioning in the everyday situation. And it works extremely well when there's a big event. But in the daily situation, you can see that the barrier on the sides, it, it makes people walk around the square. And the programs are also not connecting to the square. So what we wanted to do was to remove the barriers and make it more of an everyday situation, but still keep the possibility of having big events in the middle. So uh, the circle that you see is still the event space, let's say, but it's more intimate and scaled down. The programs can also now connect more directly to the square. So in the summer, uh, the event circle would also be a fountain with the informal seating around it. And in the winter, it would be the ice skating rink of the city. Uh, <laughs> this is not in Norway, uh, but I still want to show it because it dealt very much about creating uh, a public space in an, in an area which is completely under development. Uh, and <laughs> This is uh, maybe why uh, this project hasn't gotten attention for the public space. Uh, it was, uh, the competition was about a museum for disasters. And what you see here is uh, Atlas carrying the museum on his back. And the interior was uh, really like a collection of disasters. You had one room for earthquakes, one for rainstorms <coughs> and so on. Um, but the site was not as inspiring. It was typically big box uh, area with, uh, where the programs had no relation to each other or the surroundings. So this was about to change, but the problem was that we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. It could be extremely dense or it could be very open. So what we wanted to do was to create a, a space, much like the opera almost, just reverse a space with qualities. So if it would, to, would uh, densify a lot around it, at least you would have a space which was quite good uh, already set aside. Of course, the climate in Turkey is a bit different here than here, so uh, shaded space is, uh, is a better quality. Uh, the few elements that are holding the building are also programmed, so you would have activity underneath. Uh, we programmed also the park with the cooling elements like fountains and so on, and here you can see that it's also connecting the interior to the exterior. The last project I'll show is a project we did together with the Space Group Architects here in Oslo. Uh, and on one hand, you could say <coughs> it's about repairing a condition in the city because it's already existing fabric. But it's also about creating something new because it's so extremely big. So what you see is uh, on the top uh, the existing city of Sonnes, a small uh, town in, in the west coast of Norway, and a new city forming uh, along the harbour side with the, our square in the middle. Uh, it also has a bus station and uh, the train, which is also a barrier between the two. So in the everyday situation, again, it's uh, completely a parking lot. And this creates an additional barrier between the two parts of the city. Uh, on the upside, of course, it's so big that if there was to be an international rock concert in the region, it would be here. So uh, you could say that that's really a quality you actually want to keep. But how to combine it with a more intimate scale? Um, the municipality launched a temporary park at some point, which was extremely successful. It was so successful that they wanted to uh, make the whole site green. But actually, you can achieve a lot with um, uh, a smaller footprint. So it would be possible to combine both the park and the event space. So you could say the surroundings of the city is very low density and extremely green, but the city center is rapidly growing and densifying. So the strategy would be 
like New York, but just in a smaller scale where they set aside a central park for the whole city, and so would we. And the result is a park of three, where you have the urban side with the bus terminal to the left, uh, with the grid of trees, the event space in the middle, and a densified green park building on the existing green to the right. Uh, the roof would also connect all infrastructure and uh, provide lighting for the square, as well as creating a portal between the old and the new part of the city. Um, my almost last slide, I want to show this because uh, as an office we're extremely interested in the urban scale, but it's very important for us to also maintain um, a focus and a knowledge about the smaller scale in order to see the bigger picture. And I guess in this, uh, this picture, it, it is a series we're developing in now called uh, City Rugs. Um, and in a way, it can serve as an image of our interest in the urban extra large scale. Uh, the product is kind of depending on both that, but also the craftsmanship of the extra small scale uh, in order to become successful. Thank you.